This one goes out to the art casters. Ooh, art casters! I see you casting your spell, art casters. Casting your spell. Ooh, you're gonna cast that spell. Strike the hell! Wow! Yes, that's right. It's the Art Casters, episode 404. And on this episode, we are going to uh, kind of do a, a bit of an improv. We had a, a guest who was all set up. Oh, we missed a good opportunity there. We missed a huge opportunity uh, that Frank never wanted to miss a very good pun. Noticed. He said, is this an error? It says 404. I'll, I'll 404 for a couple seconds there. Yeah. And uh, we should have we should have thought of that before. You know, there's definitely no errors going on whatsoever on here. We don't want to push Scott's system. So Scott's not going to 404. Yeah. Scott, Scott's not 404ing from the, uh, from the overload here. And also, oh, oh. yeah, we don't want to we don't want to miss the uh, the we don't want to want to play with Lady Luck when it comes to Scott's setup. He just got it back. Um all right, so uh, we had a special guest lined up, and uh, this happens from time to time when people are freelance illustrators or graphic designers. Um, sometimes they get flooded with stuff and have to cancel stuff, and that's what happened. So I reached out to the guys, and uh, we were trying to kind of come up with something to talk about. And Corey mentioned that he's been uh, talking about and considering... The idea of like deconstructing images so we're gonna kind of get into that as a topic tonight which i think will be really cool because the second Corey said that i was like wow that could apply to so much in art outside of just style it can mm -hmm. it, it, it honestly could actually be the the very thing art is yeah. um and so it's really an interesting uh, conversation, and I think we all use it a lot in our work. So um, I think this will bring some really interesting stuff up, especially with the, the videos Scott's been doing, where he's de- and reconstructing things. Um, uh, and, uh, and again, Corey's doing this video series, um, has been doing these incredible videos on his YouTube channel. So it'll be kind of tag-teaming off that stuff. So uh, before we get into it, uh Corey, why don't you let people know where to find you all that fun stuff well if you want to follow along to the video series that uh josh is talking about get on to my email newsletter uh which looks like this and you can see it's uh it's just a sub stack and so if you go to coreykerr.com slash email uh you can jump on there with uh with a few other people and uh you'll be notified without having to ask permission from the billionaire gatekeepers, uh, it'll just tell you. I'll just tell you whenever I do something interesting instead of you having to roll the dice on the algorithm telling you. So that's the best place is uh, coreykerr.com slash email. And um, you go to my website, you can check out some other stuff, but <clears throat> worth it getting on right now because uh, I am developing this series that uh, has helped me um, improve my work and as also i am testing it with my students and it's um it's a little bit groundbreaking in the way that i have taught and so the way that i've taught in the past is um is not as effective as this and this seems to be really opening up a lot of college students minds on how to solve these problems and so if you want to jump into that um uh, jump on that email newsletter and uh it's all going to be youtube based and so you can you can subscribe on youtube as well I like it. You're going to need to start wearing a lab coat on your videos as well, Corey, <laughs> uh, with with the, the mad la lab laboratory of ideas that you're doing. Oh, yeah. um, but no, I, I think it will be beneficial. Um, and I would say a lot of what Corey's going over are like things that, um, man, I, I would have killed to know uh, early on in illustration. And I think that something Corey, Scott, and I all have like a passion for is trying to kind of share knowledge that we had to acquire like the hard way. 
And some of it you guys might already know, but a lot of it, you know, you, you may not. And honestly, a, a lot of that would be a really big boost, especially early on in your career. Or, or you know, if you need a little refresh, um, which we all do from time to time. Um, or just like, you know, maybe level up your art. Um, okay, so uh, Scott, where can everybody uh, find your new videos? Okay, your, your new directions, which by the way, there is a song that will be coming from Jim Lujan of said title uh, that w that I, I decided not to share with you guys because I think it needs to be a ghettomation or not ghettomation. What am I blanking out on here, Scott? Uh, um, uh, fake explosion. Yeah, fake yeah. explosion. So it needs to be on the fake explosion. And I was like, I don't want to rob this from this fake explosion because it's too good. But uh, but if you guys like that little parody at the intro, that's uh, that's Jim stuff. Okay, Scott, where can people? Yeah. So first, you'll have to excuse. I don't know if you can hear in the background. I've got a dog that's going nuts. I think there must be a rabbit outside or something. They're freaking out. So pardon that. But <laughs> <laughs> if you go, yeah, you can go to you can go to my YouTube channel, Circworks. Just search Circworks on YouTube where you see my latest videos uh, where uh, I'm just taking uh, old ephemera from the six or from 70s, 80s and 90s and reverse engineering it, kind of figure out how it works and putting my own spin on it, recreating it. It's a lot of fun. Um, or you can go to my website at circworks.com where you can find my comic book, Young and the Dead. It's a kids versus zombie adventure story. Just think Goonies meets Night of the Living Dead if you're into that kind of 80s nostalgia, you know, kids as protagonist type stories, but with zombies, then you'll probably dig it. Um, I also have uh, I also have prints and, and digital products and all kinds of stuff over there at my website. So definitely check it out. Oh, and another thing, there's a Kickstarter. Uh, I I don't have a link, but uh, I'm involved with a Kickstarter right now for yes. Jay Stevens, who we had on the had on the show. Uh, was it last last time? Mm -hmm. it was last time. Thank yeah. you for um, more. Yeah, that that is live and it's doing pretty good. They they reached their funding in I think in about the first four or five hours, but they're oh, still cool. going and there's tons of tons of extras mm -hmm. and and stress goals and cool stuff. But um, but I've got a variant cover uh, that I did for that. So if, I guess if you just search Figgy Furthermore, it's it's spelled like it sounds um, uh, on 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 uh, on Kickstarter, you'll probably find it. Or Jay Stevens if you search Jay Stevens on on kickstarter so definitely check that out yeah you guys definitely should and also if you haven't watched that episode it was really inspiring uh jay is a really just super inspiring artist and really cool and it, it dawned on me after i i knew he had worked on some stuff that my son likes but um i i re-looked at uh, my son's like collection of uh, teen titans that he was really into the comics and what do you know, Jay Stevens did a bunch of art that my son's like a super geek about. So uh, really, really cool. And um, and yeah, and it's awesome. Like Scott's covers are so rad and that style's great. So it's, it's really exciting. Um, cool. All right. Well, if you guys haven't yet, uh, you're watching my channel. So if you haven't yet uh, hit subscribe, hit the bell so you get notifications uh, when we're about to go live. And also make sure you picked up Jacob's apartment or two stories if you're into indie comics and if you guys want to take a head start, I'm just, I'm mentioning this cause I think Dave is one of the smartest cartoonists I know. And this came in the mail early. Uh, it was on pre-order. I didn't expect it, but it actually came yesterday. So I'm going to be reading this this weekend because this is our guest next weekend. So make sure you're also signed up for the newsletter so that uh, you guys can uh, hear our talk with um, Dave. I'm going to hopefully dig into this uh, beast of a work um, this weekend, but it's called uh, Mary Tyler Moorhawk. It's out from top shelf. Um, all right. So deconstructing. Uh, Corey, you want to kick it off <laughs> with that? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so I'll try to be quick because I've got, I've got two uh, eight or nine minute videos that kind of go into this, but um, and then, and then I'm kind of curious on where you guys take it because I've already kind of done stuff, but um, the, the basic idea is, um, I'm trying, I'm trying to come up with, so I teach in the communication department and I teach visual communication. And so the students that I'm teaching are not going to be fine artists and they're not going to be, uh, in museums. They're going to be working for businesses and clients. They're going to be on marketing teams and advertising teams and PR teams. Right. And, um, 
And so everything that they're going to be doing, and this is something interesting in my master's degree, uh, they made a really big point to say for the graphic designers and for the illustrators, uh, you are going to be communicating a message to an audience. And so uh, I, I've got this uh, pri prior to this, I would look at, I would look at stuff that they're doing and I would talk individually about what wasn't working about it, but I didn't have like a good framework to say like, um, you know, I don't know. I, I didn't have like a decent framework to say like, this isn't the best or whatever. And so, so anyway, um, this, this is pretty much that. And so uh, from a messaging standpoint, every image, and when I say image, I'm talking about um, anything from anything from design, illustration, comics, uh, animation, um, advertising, PR, um, film, video, t-shirt design, you know, wax packs, any, anything that you've got will have something that you're trying to communicate to a specific audience, right? And so that, that's going to be the concept. And the concept will drive your elements. And the elements are the things uh, that you can see. Those are the, the nouns. The, those are the, your subjects or your symbols that you're going to use. And they come from the concept. And so you're going to use word lists and mind maps and all of those different kind of creative things that you can do to kind of like come up with the elements that are going to be in your image, right? Um, what are the best ways to communicate this concept? And then the composition is the arrangement of those elements. And so we go from the elements and then we arrange that and you come up with a bunch of different compositions. And then the style, uh, those are the visual choices that you make in the execution of that composition. Um, and so that's going to be tools and color choices and, and um, you know, uh, what you're doing with what you're doing with the mark making and, and um, basically how you implement that composition. Uh, and then you take that image and you check it. You ask yourself, does this image uh, communicate my concept? And um, oftentimes it won't, uh, especially if you're starting out. Um, and sometimes that's kind of frustrating. And what students will do is they'll say, oh, yeah, that's kind of what I meant. Like they just pretend like they intended that at the beginning right? yeah they invent their objectives their concept after they make an image and um that's not how client work works and that's not how um you know employment works you, you don't just your boss just doesn't come to you and say hey make something for me and then we'll decide we'll find an audience for it after the fact you know it's yeah. like i need these people to know this thing so we need an ad right or we need a poster or we need a an animation or whatever we're trying to explain this specific thing and so if it doesn't meet that, then what that means is that you've got a problem either with the style, uh, the composition, or the elements. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you look at each one of those and ask yourself a series of questions, which I won't really go through because uh, I have a video on that. Um, yeah, you guys and should then, watch those videos too. Make sure. Yeah, and then, and then you fix that. Then the combination of the elements. Oh, no. Yeah. We lost what is being L. communicated. Oh, am I you back? Just kind of cut in and out real quick. Corey, oh, sorry. I think, you're, yeah. I think you're good now. We lost you at yeah. L of elements. Oh, okay. The combination of the elements, the composition, and the style, that's what's being communicated, right? Awesome. And so this concept is doing double duty. At the beginning, it's what you intend to communicate. And at the end, it's what is being communicated by the combination of these other three. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, that's that's kind of it. But, but what I've found is... This is a really a really good way to take students through like what is going on. And so they often don't know what I mean when I'm like, well, I don't know. I think your composition is off. And so I came up with these examples like um, these would all be these would all be compositional sketches um, for the same elements. Right. And so the elements of this would be like the bird, the branch and the and the clouds. And there is an infinite number of ways of moving your camera around and posing those, those different elements and, and uh, you know, different ways of emoting and gesture um, that you can do. And that's all like the design principles, right? That's your repetition, your contrast, your, your proximity and all that stuff. Um, and you're trying to still communicate that message with these elements. Um, and so 
then then you take one of those and you take it into style and style is basically um the visual choices that you make um in executing that and so like this for this for example we've got like a graphite and watercolor style that's pretty saturated in its color schemes we've got kind of like a upa cartoon modern we've got paper cutout we've got um kind of a, a mock uh, stained glass window there's there's more of a vector and more of mm -hmm. a kind of a dripping illustration and so you can go and each one of those has a series of rules that are implemented in how and when you're going to change uh the hue or the saturation or the brightness or the or the thickness of the lines or or those types of things and that's that's all of those visual choices we would consider that style and even though each one of these has the same elements the cloud the bird and the branch and the same composition this profile of this bird next to a branch with the tree in the upper or with a with a, a cloud in the upper left the mood of it the vibe of it the feeling of it changes significantly based on the visual decisions that you make and so each of these feels a little bit different mm -hmm. um and so the combination of the elements the composition and the style um will create what is being communicated and that's and that's basically what what this more recent one was but i actually think i actually think there's a lot more to this and this is where i'm kind of curious and where you, where you guys are coming from on this because i think you can use this deconstructive method to pretty much learn anything um and josh in the chat you had mentioned uh, as we were preparing for the show like figure drawing right mm -hmm. if you just tell somebody just like draw a person um they're probably never going to get good at drawing people but if yeah. you're like okay let's deconstruct what makes a human figure a human figure and mm -hmm. what is different from a human figure and other primates or lizards or a tree like and you start to understand what is and isn't human from a proportional standpoint mm -hmm. proportion would be one component that you could deconstruct right and yeah. then as you figure that out and you build each of those pieces and you understand the ingredients as you put them together um the reconstruction, I suppose, after the deconstruction, you're going to be a lot better off. Yeah. No, I, I think, um, I, uh, well, I don't want to jump in too early. If, if I am, let me know. No, go ahead. I'm, okay. I'm, I mean, that's pretty much, that's pretty much the idea is I think any image can be broken down into those four components. Yeah. Um, and I think every decision that you make is in one of those four categories. Um, and if they're working together, then you're communicating something. And if not, then um uh, then you get a problem with one of those three i love that um that is a really thorough way to kind of break it down because i i too have had uh times where you're addressing all of those issues within a critique but you're right there there is sometimes a disconnect um you know when you're trying to get a um a student or an early artist or even an older artist to like really try to boil down like well yeah like why did you make this choice Right. And sometimes they aren't even aware that it was a choice, right. you know, um, and then they're like, why does that matter? Or what am I what choice am I making that's wrong? You know, and I think, um, yeah, breaking it down is, is really a, a good way to do that. Um, I, I, I think of like, I forget, I always get these two confused. So I think it was Goth or Goeth. I never can remember how you pronounce the dude's name. Uh, one of the fathers Goeth. of criticism. What's yeah. up? I've always heard Goth, but yeah. yeah. So he had like this basic principle of criticism where it was like, basically what is the artist trying to say and how well do they say it? <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's it. I mean, that's the structure of at least his formal structure of criticism was basically centered around those questions. Oh, yeah. and then the third would be, is it worth saying? And right. I think like, honestly, um, deconstructing, the purpose of each intention in an image um, within a framework, right? You can deconstruct to the point where it's just absurdity, but mm -hmm. um, I, I think it can really help you. Yeah. To focus and to have a clear narrative. It's, it's kind of similar to, I think people forget that art is a language. It's a visual mm -hmm. language. And so just like any language, right? You can break down a sentence and be like, Oh, I know why this is a, a problem. It's a run on. <laughs> right. Or, I know why this is a problem. Like you're using, um, you know, like the wrong uh, tense or like the wrong kind of like, oh, you're trying to make people feel this way. And the sentence kind of feels more like this emotion. Um, and how can we kind of change that to kind of modify uh, and fit those things? So, yeah. yeah. Anyhow, my point 
in in all that rambling was like yeah i think i think uh that's very helpful um and i think honestly i think that is really the way like you were se- kind of uh segueing to Corey. um instantly that made me think of drawing because one of the things that unlocks drawing i think early on for artists is to start looking at objects and fitting shapes into them that's what right. i was going to say you know the cylinders the spheres yeah um square you know cubes all that stuff i mean you can build i mean it's it's basically what Corey's talking about they're building blocks and you can yes. and quite literally when you're learning to draw it's it's all building blocks you can take yeah. like three or four three-dimensional shapes and pretty much construct anything you want and yeah. unfortunately i think a lot of people just look at things in sur- on surface level and they have a hard time like a lot of people when they're starting to draw i mean things start looking wonky or or when people are drawing perspective i mean if you start breaking things down the whole idea of I forgot in real life versus comics how many heads heads is, is oh yeah seven in real life but eight in comics or seven or six I don't know I can never but, remember yeah. it, yeah. I believe I believe Greek the Greek is seven and a half high okay. yeah and that's that's okay. like a that's like an Olympic ideal and then Liefeld era image comics it was like <laughs> hard to tell because sometimes the heads were pins yeah or you could have like uh, you know three hundred teeth in your mouth or something like that but but I mean really I mean there's like if once you start once you start looking at even like for me i always look at like the distance of an arm versus a leg or whatever yeah. and once you start figuring out that and you start comparing it to other parts of the body or whatever when you're working with human anatomy there's really no excuse to to have things so off because it it, it really can be broken down or in the face like yeah. there's a there's a i i mean simple things like there's an eye space in between your eyes typically i mean mm-hmm. of course if you're doing like more cartoony like a peanuts if you have the little dot eyes that close, they're going to look weird. So, yeah. you, but you learn the language <laughs> and then you can, you can take from that and you can kind of create a style of cartooning based on that. But knowing that, yeah. you know, is, is kind of the, the first step. So, yeah. yeah. So we've, yeah. we've got a, we've got a question in the chat that I want to get to, but you, you both brought something, two things up that I want to talk about. So really quick, I was talking while you were, or I was drawing while you were talking, Scott. And so uh, there are three shapes in two dimensions that everything fits into you have an ellipse which is a circle or an oval Mm -hmm. you've got a triangle and then you have a rectangle uh if you translate those into three dimensions then the circle becomes either a sphere or a cylinder Mm -hmm. the triangle becomes either a pyramid or a cone and the rectangle becomes a cube and literally everything is some sort of version of those things yeah. um now sometimes they bend and squish and stretch uh but if you can if you can understand how to shade and and think through the volumetric mass of these five shapes yeah. then you can uh understand how anything works the nice thing about this is when you start to do this um it makes things you, you kind of break the visual semiotics the symbol system yeah um and so like most people will draw a hand without any training, they'll draw a hand that looks like this, yeah. right? And so they've got a big mass and they've got other things and it's always, it's always completely spread out. Like yeah. it's always straight fingers and, and there's only two instances when you hold your hands like that, and that's spirit fingers and jazz hands. And if there's you're no an other... art teacher, you know, you're familiar with like doing this and then maybe occasionally you'll be like making it into a hot dog because it's a joke <laughs> right. that they're hot dog fingers when you're critiquing yeah. it. Um, anyhow. But if you take if you take the the hand as a shape, then the palm is is a bent uh, is a bent cube, um, and then you have a sphere mm-hmm. for the meat of the thumb, and you've got a series of cylinders um, for the fingers, and you can come up with kind of the actual structure of the hand based on the understanding of these shapes. And so I've used a sphere and cylinders and a kind of a warped uh, cube and it, and it, it does that and hands, hands and faces and bodies are some of the most difficult things you can do. The other, the other thing that you guys had mentioned that I think is really interesting is um, the way I'm counting abstraction is in style. Right. And so I think the style of something that the, the way that we abstract something is part of a style. So you can tell, mm-hmm. like we were mentioning, like life field tends to abstract, you know, the human figure 
uh, in a way that often doesn't make sense. But, you know, mm -hmm. but I mean, there's still there's still communication there and those types of things. And if you look at like Sam Keith, who did like the Max, yeah. you know, he abstracts in a way that puts everybody really bottom heavy and you've got these really big kind of calves and, and giant feet, um, yeah. you know. And, um, you know, if you look at in, any particular artist, the abstraction of that, and I, I, I've come up with a good, um, I haven't had anybody argue with me too much on this yet. Um, but for abstraction, um, it's, uh, it's what, what can you add? Um, what can you eliminate? Um, what can you exaggerate? And what can you simplify? Mm -hmm. And so every, everything is some, every, every type of style um, is some form of abstraction. It's it's the this is not a pipe thing, the painting of a pipe that says this mm -hmm. isn't a pipe, right? It's not a pipe, but it's an illusion. It's a 2D representation that alludes to the idea of a pipe. So every illustration, animation, cartoon, drawing, painting that we do, it alludes to real life or it alludes to the emotion of an event or, mm -hmm. or, or a feeling or a concept. It's, it's alluding to that thing. And that illusion is an abstraction. It's a shorthand to communicate those things. And so everything is some sort of addition, subtraction, exaggeration, or simplification. And so if you look at, you know, if you look at the human face, there are tens of thousands of pores, there's wrinkles, there's creases, uh, and as we draw those in comics, uh, we put a few ink lines down that is a simplification of that. And it's an abstraction of that. And, yeah. uh, you know, it, it exaggerates and simplifies different parts of that. We're deleting a lot of the extraneous information that we don't need, all of those extra details. Um, and we might be exaggerating proportions like the nose or making the eyes bigger, like Disney characters, those types of things. And so that abstraction is, is really interesting. And then yeah. I, I just want to get to this comment uh, right after Josh's comment. Oh, the only thing I was going to say, just tying into that, is the beauty of deconstructing, too, is that you can take something like, you know, in regards to what, you know, we were talking about with shape or even with analyzing style, you can take something that where the illusion is so convincing. Like, you know, this throws off early artists all the time is like mm -hmm. drawing, you know, a car. Um, and then the wheels. Um, so if you have like the front of your car here, um, hold on, let me, let me move it. Um, if you have like the front of your car here, uh, you know, in space or whatever, by the way, I think that that rabbit came to mind. <laughs> my neck of the woods. He's, he's translated, transferred across Bernie. It's okay, bud. Uh, anyhow. So if you draw a car, right. It's pretty easy to kind of figure out the perspective of like the basic boxes that you're working with. Right. But where young artists, you know, including myself, like if I sketch it and I forget these basics, you know, when you draw a, a wheel, it might kind of look a little wonky unless you remember that you're drawing like a cylinder that's yeah. attached to like a, a another, you know, cylinder. And the second you kind of do that, then if you like turn your wheels or whatever in perspective, then your wheels are going to turn like cylinders, not like, so you won't have wonky wheels. Like you're going to be turning the cylinder in space. Um, and you'll remember that the cylinder is tethered to each other, right? With another cylinder. Right. So it's like, if you remember those basics, it can take something that can confuse you, almost anyone. Like um, a, a, another good example um, from streams past where I think Corey helped me out with that is breaking down a bicycle wheel and the spokes. Oh, right. And it, it is so complex and hard to draw by looking at, but if you observe it and really break it down, it's actually a very simple pattern. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's so much of it right. that you can lose the forest for the, tr or you can lose, lose the forest for the trees, you know, where you, you lose, lose the spokes for the hub. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, my point it, is the act of deconstructing is so valuable like that Corey's talking about because it uh, it helps you look at stuff that's stunning by other artists like right. or you know and and not have a uh, visual overload. Don't let the illusion that they're trying to make all of us are trying to make that illusion to communicate something. Don't be lost by the illusion. We're the filmmaker that needs to see the guy behind yeah. the camera, right? Um 
Yeah. And it can also it can also be helpful by way of uh by way of understanding why something that is beautifully rendered yes. uh is boring or, yes. or confusing. And it's yes. just like mm. Because, I mean, you can draw every single hair on the squirrel, but if it's just a picture of a squirrel, it's just, but why? Yeah. What is it What is it doing? What is it communicating? Okay, Cold so here's... Sound and fury signifying nothing, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as we look through uh, look through life through a, a glass darkly. Um, and so if we're, if we're looking here... Um, oh, wait. Whoops. Let's see. This is... That was, uh, that was Frank explaining based to me. Um, so if one of Scott's students makes a comic book uh, using Picasso's cubism style, how would Scott judge it other than if it follows the rules of cubism? And he there's a correction that, later on. They're referring to you, actually, not me. Yeah. And then okay. he said either either of us could answer. But um, I'm kind of curious on what you guys would say. But what I would say is uh, cubism would be the style. So if I'm going to if I'm going to go back to this, uh, just this graphic while I'm talking. So the style would be cubism, right? There's a ser there's a set of rules um, that Picasso kind of developed that makes us recognize that is cubism, and if we break too many of those rules, uh, then it would be some other style, right? It might be it might be a pointillism or something like that, right? But cubism would be the style. That would be one of the three components, and my argument would be if that supports the message and speaks to the particular audience, then then that style is fine, right? Um, if you're doing that style because you like it, then it might actually be very distracting, um, you know? But I mean, if uh, I think that cubism could be really interesting. Uh, say you got Capullo's uh, uh, Batman where, you know, he's in the Court of Owls and they go they go under the, under the city and Batman gets drugged and starts tripping. At that point in time, a stylistic choice that they could have made could have been cubism to show... Like that we're drifting out of reality at this point in time. Like we're not sure what's real and what's not. Yeah. Um, they didn't make that choice, but I think it could have been an appropriate choice at that point. Um, and so if it works for the concept, meaning that it communicates what it is you're trying to communicate, I think it's fine. So I would, I would judge it on how well it is following that particular style from a craftsmanship standpoint. Yeah. Um, and whether or not it's appropriate for the particular message uh, or narrative that you're trying to do. And that would be a third of what I'd be talking about. I'd also be looking at the composition, which would be the placement of those elements and the elements themselves, which is what it is that you're, you're trying to use. And so in that case, it would be Batman, the court of owls, you'd have Talon, you'd have the, the sewer system that he's in or whatever. Those are all the elements. And then the, sh the shot selection is that composition, the, the blocking, where are you mm -hmm. placing those elements and how you're doing that stuff. The style is then the visual symbolism and the rules that you do. And so I wouldn't just say offhand that cubism is good or bad, um, but I would say that there are more appropriate times to use it and less appropriate times to use it, depending on what it is that you're trying to communicate. Yeah, and I mean, I, I would even think about the most famous pieces of cubism, right? Where you have things like like Guernica is probably like the most, right. in my opinion, famous thing of Picasso's, right? And his whole purpose in the distortion in that is like to depict the hor horrific nature of, of war and kind of the devastation <coughs> that it wreaks on civilians. Right. And, you know, the idea was to actually make it more like abst so abstract that it tries to convey the emotion of um of the impact of that violence rather than like some literal depiction um, right. to hopefully kind of create like a, a bigger emotional weight now whether that's successful or not you know that's that's up to you know <laughs> the the viewer but um but yeah like i would think about that yeah for sure and i think when considering style you know, um, man, how much better of an answer is that to give a client if they're like, why, um, why did you do this in a specific style or something like that? And you're like, <coughs> oh, well, I was trying to convey these right. specific things and by moving this and they're not seeing you just BS your way through it and going like, well, you know, when really you want to just say, oh, I just wanted it to look cool. Uh, right, right. <laughs> and and this can give you a reason as to like why it looks cool or what it is that looks cool to you um, and, and makes you a better communicator, both as an artist and as a salesman for your own art, uh, yeah. you know, which, which I think, yeah, I, I just think that that's very helpful. Um, 
Yeah, because I've definitely had a lot of students uh, when you're teaching them art <laughs> where that's their answer where you're like, well, why'd you make the choice of like having this specific lighting? Well, it looked cool. Right. Okay, but like, what are you trying to say with it? Well, I mean, I just thought it would look cool. Okay, but. <laughs> <laughs> right. And even that can be an aesthetic, you know, like if you use the word like rad or whatever, sure. uh, you know, I think that can be an aesthetic, but um, I don't know. Anyhow, um, that was yeah, a deviation. And, and style, style switching is an interesting thing. So, so my goal at work is to prepare these communication students for the field of visual communication, which could be in any industry because there isn't an organization, a company, a group, a government, a, a nonprofit. There, there is no court of owls. <laughs> yeah. But there, but there isn't anybody out there that doesn't need to communicate. And visual communication is one of the most effective ways to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, but with that style switching is really important because a fine artist can say, well, this is my style. Right. But a, a, an applied artist is like, okay, let's see the style guide and, uh, and what are the rules of this particular style for this brand, right? Or for this audience. Mm -hmm. And so the ability also from deconstruction is to look at an example, a reference of something and understand, I'll, I'll tell you, well, let me finish that sentence and understand why that looks the way it does. Like when you look at something, you can tell the difference between uh, things that are very similar, like Rick and Morty and Gravity Falls, uh, you know, there's kind of a modern sensibility, um, you know, Family Guy and The Simpsons. Mm -hmm. Those are very similar in in the execution of that style, but there are differences. And in those in those differences, you can articulate what it is that makes that style a particular style. And if it's just like, I don't know, you can just tell then you don't understand it. You haven't spent the time deconstructing it, but you can understand it and you definitely can't implement it until you deconstruct it and understand like, what are the rules by which I'm, by, by which I'm, you know, doing this type of thing. Um, and yeah. all, of, all of that is really a valuable skill set to be able to say like, Hey, I can show up and do what you need me to do. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, and this kind of reminds me of uh, the guest we had last last week, which was Jay Stevens, where I guarantee you, if you show Jay Stevens like some classic gold key cartoon mm -hmm. comics, yep. he tells you specifically what is going on in the line weight yep. with those cartoonists, like what formal qualities they're employing, uh, what, what kind of templates they're using to kind of make those characters, how many heads tall they are, uh, what kind of vibe it has like what um uh what kind of geometry is going on like what the art movement was at the time i guarantee you, he could probably break down a lot of that uh mm -hmm. because you can see it in his work it's it's like his work is a a shout out to that and that also reminds me of like scott doing that with you know your um your retro um I almost want to say retroventions, but that was your, that was your, uh, your yeah, pins. you can call it that. You can call but it that. I mean, it's like your videos that are kind of, uh, breaking down retro stuff. And I call um, it, yeah, I call it reventification. Yes. There we go. Um, it reminds me of that. Like, does that kind of, I mean, what is the process of like deconstruction like for that, where you're literally like, you know, you might even be pulling apart like the package of a card to see like the die line of yeah. the fold and stuff. So yeah, a lot of that, like like when I do the when I did the cereal box, you know, it's basically taking apart a cereal, uh, you know, taking the glue off and finding where the folds are, and then I actually took that and I I scanned it in and just saw, and then once I scanned it in, I I had to measure it because you don't always get the right size when you scan stuff in. But figuring all that and then going into Illustrator and building the template from there, same mm -hmm. things with the wax packs, opening up an actual wax pack, figuring out kind of the size. And then um, and I had to experiment for a while and it wasn't until like a, a viewer of mine um, shared a technique that they were using till I, you know, till I came across this this new technique. But it's it's a lot of experimentation because that first video I did a while back on wax packs, it was about as close as. I could get at the time and it was kind of close, but, but now it's just like totally dialed into where it's almost indistinguishable from an actual wax packs. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm doing. I was actually, I just went to over to uh, ghost Catholics comics. They were Arnold from Gold from Goldkeep where yeah. he was showing me some of the, some of the 
cards that he's designing for that wax pack. And I was talking about what I'm doing as far as I've been searching for all this, trying to find the exact paper that a lot of these cards printed on where it's, it's like white on one side. Um, and then it's got like a, a, like a craft paper, like a chipboard kind of on the other side, but there's so many different variations of that color, that chipboard and I ordered a big box <laughs> and it, it, it's, it, they'll work for certain things, but, but I still couldn't get that exact same color. So I keep trying to find all these samples to get the exact thing. And he's like, he's like, Oh, I'm just, I'm just kind of throwing the background, you know, the, the image of, of the craft paper into the card. So when it prints, it'll look like that. And I've mm. done that before too, but for, for what I'm doing, I just want it to be so exact that you can almost not tell the difference. Like if this yeah. looks like a real, looks we're find, not just visually, but it's going to feel yeah, exactly find the, same the exact thing. paper and everything. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and it's kind of, hard. it's, it, I've, I've struggled finding it. You know, I, I keep searching and keep ordering these, if I can, just a small sample until I find the exact one. But yeah, um, it's a lot of that type of type of thing, you know, or just, you know, or when you're doing the graphic design, just, you know, a lot of research trying to, and some of it's kind of hard because a lot of, there's not always good reference out there because some of the stuff's really old and no one's really chronicled it or, or whatever. So it's hard to find, find good reference for some of this stuff. Like there's one that I want to do on like, there's these old cardboard, you know, spaceships that used to be able to order and you build them and stuff. But it's really hard to find. I mean, you get the image of what it should look like, but it's kind of a diagram, but it's hard to find actual images of ones that kids actually created. And then once you get that, how do you know, let alone the actual files? So, it, yeah. so I might have to kind of come up with my own and just build it out of paper and then just enlarge it and make templates from there if I ever do that, that type of thing. So yeah, it's, it's, it's fun, but it's, it's kind of, it's, it, it, it does take a lot of kind of digging and trying to figure out how this stuff works. Yeah. And I think that what Corey was doing with that chart too, of breaking it down into some categories that you can then deconstruct using, right. Could be beneficial in like almost any context, like right. with, um, you know, if you're trying to figure out, uh, like, like, um, Actually, this I'll, I'll bring up an example of like a retro thing I was trying a couple years back and I couldn't quite figure out why it never looked right. Um, so back when I was doing T-shirt design, I prided myself in doing like original old school looking halftone dots. Mm -hmm. And I would do that like through a variety of ways, like using the kind of um, the Photoshop halftoning. Mm -hmm. But I would literally not use their halftone. I would use that to kind of create. I would use that in grayscales to create actual halftones that I could then layer over each other mm -hmm. in the original colors. Uh, Cause you will notice in these older colors, um, the red was really rich. Jay Stevens actually mentioned this too, <laughs> where you had this really like yellowy red. I think it was like um, 485 Pantone 485. It was like that kind of red, like, uh, like a, like a vintage car or a guitar where it's like that Fiesta red kind of vibe. <laughs> Um, and you'll see that on a lot of those old wax packs and stuff. But but the paper, like Scott was saying, you know, um, a lot of it was like kind of absorbing a lot of the ink because mm -hmm. it would be like that kind of boarded back or something like that. So the artist would intentionally oversaturate um, to, so that when it went to print and lost saturation, it would still retain mm. some brilliance of color. And so there's this really anyhow. But. I used to look at that stuff and deconstruct it. And there was one thing I could never quite figure out until I started doing those separations. Cause I was like, I love how wacky packs have that like offset color. I'm not quite sure why that is. And then the second you start doing the process, you realize, Oh, somebody just screwed up. <laughs> like they just, Oh yeah. Just, well, it's, and it's not always alignment. somebody. Yeah. It's not it's always somebody. The it's the machine. And, yeah. and, 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 and it's such a, a small print stuff. area. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, that the alignment just one of the plates just shifted or the paper shifted or the paper dried like in the run of like a couple of colors. And then when that last color, you know, it, it but that's that gives a specific look and feel. And again, like with deconstruction, you can see why, because you, you go, oh, it's part of the printing process. It wasn't like the artists were like, ha ha, I'll offset this. Now we do. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like. You know, even looking at the origin of those kind of things and, and like and uh, and and deconstructing the why um, can even answer a stylistic thing. 
you know, what were the cartoon modern guys kind of trying to do with like that old style of cartooning? Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I think that's really, I don't know, just a beneficial practice. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And I think you can use it. Um, so, so one of the, one of the things that I'm trying to come up with is, is like a, a course of study that people could do on their own to improve something. And I was talking to Ryan Otley. <clears throat> um, I said that like I know him, but I was talking to him at a show, but anyway, no, no, you should, uh, you should be like, I was talking to Ots. <laughs> yeah. I was talking to the Ot, Rye, Ot Rye. master. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I call him Rag Guy. So no, I was, talking, I was talking to Ryan Otley one time, and he was, and he was talking about how he learned. He says he doesn't use reference for people, um, which is, and he's he's an incredible uh, illustrator when it comes to like the human figure. Um, he has some shorthands, like I, I think he probably oversimplifies uh, chins, in my opinion, but. But anyway, like um, the shape of the face is is something that he's got like a shorthand for, and he's you know that's his style. Like he's got he's got all those things. But what he did was this deconstructive process. And so as as a teenager, he would have one sketchbook for arms and one sketchbook for legs and one sketchbook for hands and one sketchbook for feet and one sketchbook for heads, and he would just fill pages and pages and pages of arms in in different in different configurations, you know, different people's arms, different size arms, like when they're flexing, when they're not, when they're bent, when they're straight. Um, and then you would do the same thing with legs. And, and so each one of those, it was a deconstruction of the human figure. And then he, he honed in and specifically learned. And so it's interesting because if you do very specific things a lot in a short period of time, you can learn, a ton. And so that's, that's, I mean, that's what I did when I taught myself after effects um, is I went in there and I said, I'm going to learn how to do this stuff. And instead of just saying, I'm going to learn all of after effects, right. I would take one particular thing and I would reverse engineer how the pros are doing it. Yep. You know, I, I would look at that and I would say, what are they doing? Like what is actually happening here? What's giving me the impression mm. that that, is made of wood or metal or, or cloth, you know, what's, what's giving me an impression that things are going quickly or slowly, like what it, there's something being communicated. And then I would try to figure out within the choices that they were making, uh, what was communicating that thing. And so then I went into the software and I'm like, okay, now I know what I want to do. And this is, I think people get this backwards a lot is they learn tools first. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if I don't know how to use the ellipse tool, uh, and that's it in illustrator. Uh, I, I can tell you what my next, uh, 27 illustrations are going to look like. It's all going to be ellipses. You yep. know what I mean? It's kind of like my buddy. We've had him on the show, Christian Mollum. Uh, he teaches video and he says, uh, show me a student who just bought a drone and I'll show you what their next six short films look like, <laughs> <clears throat> you know? And so yeah. tools come after, right? Tools come after the understanding. And so you deconstruct to try to figure out why and how yeah. and, and what's going on. And then once you identify a single how um, or a single what, yeah. right, then you hone in on that and through repetition and through master studies and then through style switching and those types of things, uh, you try to figure out uh, your way of, of communicating that particular thing, right? Yeah. And so what, what makes an apple look like an apple and not a pear um, or a peach you know, there's some very subtle differences. They're all kind of spherical fruit with a stem at the top and a leaf. But mm -hmm. when we look at a pear or a peach or an apple, there's some very specific things that are iconic to that particular thing. And if you if you abstract beyond that iconic nature of that thing, then it yeah. becomes nonsense. But you can abstract right up to until that point, and it still feels like an apple or a pear or a peach or an orange. And so that's that's really important because understanding the, the core element that's being communicated through that thing is, is the key to understanding that. And then beyond that, 
how you choose to compose it, arrange it, uh, turn it, exaggerate it, and then the style that you choose to render it in, you can render it in any style. Yeah. You can compose it in any composition with other elements. And as long as you understand the, the iconic nature of that and you've studied that in your sketchbook where you've drawn it over and over and over again, and you've tried to draw, draw it as photorealistic as you can, you've tried to yeah. draw it as simplified as you can, you know, you've tried different tools. You've tried to draw it in ink and in ink wash and in watercolor and in gouache. And uh, you try to do it in pencil and graphite and charcoal. Once you do that, you can really break down and understand, like, I know what makes this look like this thing. I know yeah. it's iconic nature. Uh, at, at any point in time with that, you can abstract it to the point of uh, almost to the point of, of nonsense. And it'll still feel like that thing because you've identified it. And that's true I if, that. I, if I want to learn... How to draw the hand, right? I'm going to draw a lot of hands. But before I draw a lot of hands, I'm going to look at a lot of hands. And I'm going to understand what makes human hands look different than than ape hands, than monkey hands, than gorilla hands, than what makes it different than, than raccoon paws and mm -hmm. all this type of stuff. The proportions, the size, the, the placement. Uh, and what's really interesting is I learned this recently. <clears throat> now I'm super ram rambling, but this is super interesting. All mammals have the same basic bone structure, and the real difference is going to be in, in the proportions of those bones. So, for yeah. example, we have the same number of vertebrae as a giraffe. And that just blew my mind. Like, my buddy's a he's a zookeeper at the LA Zoo, and he was like, hey, did you know we have the same number of vertebrae? I started looking at that, and even things that look like there's, there's no way that I can relate to that. Um, uh, There's Chris, commonalities. Yeah. yeah, Chris is saying even whales have hip bones. Um, like horses. It looks hey, like they even, have... even humans have tails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, it, it looks like a horse is like nothing like a human, right? But when you look at it, um, part of their leg is just a really long toe. Yep. Right? And the other part is a really long foot. And so where, where it looks like they have multiple knees, that's just a knee and an ankle and a toe joint. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, and the, and then you're like, oh, okay. So it's just the proportions of those things. And so understanding the proportions and what makes it iconically yeah. um, human or ape or, you know, whatever, um, dog or whatever, is really important. And once you understand that, then you can get, then you can go in and you can start abstracting and do that type of thing. And so. I love that. Um, I also like that just in the process of anything. Uh, Corey, I'm a little bummed. Like we're going to have to have your, your buddy on who's a, um, a guitar maker that has to happen. Oh yeah, now. for sure. So mm -hmm. maybe like a show or two from now, but, um, but, uh, one of the things I like about even guitar building or anything you're taking on that requires tools, right? You really aren't going to do yourself a lot of favors, just buying a crap load of tools. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what's better is to like, figure out what your objective is. Like, what do you need to do on this thing? Right. And then start deconstructing that and realizing what tools you need to accomplish the job. Right. Um, same thing. Like we're let's say you walked in your house and found like a giant hole in your wall, you know, mm -hmm. and you need tools. Uh, if the first thing you did was just start throwing tools at the wall, it's not going to do anything. <laughs> it's like right. you need to think about what you're trying to achieve. And then the tools service that need. Not the other right. way around where it's, um, you know, and I and I do think um, especially, you know, newer artists like tend to obsess a little too much about the tools, like which brush, which whatever, and not enough about like, well, what are you trying to do like that? Yeah. You know, um, it's like a therapy thing, too. I, I remember um, a friend of mine who who was uh, had like a really good therapist that they said was like really beneficial to them. Uh, they said they asked like two questions, which were just like they'd listen to him like talk and be like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, OK. Mm -hmm. And then like an hour into it, they'd be like, OK, well, what are what are you what do you want? <laughs> and the person was like, huh? Uh, well, I guess I want this. OK, what are you going to do to get that? And it's that was just it. Like, what are what mm -hmm. are you trying to accomplish? What are you going to do to make that happen? That Yeah. Um. And it's amazing well, to me that like we're visual communicators and we struggle with that too. You know, when we're doing art where we'll be like, well, what are, what are you trying to do here? What are you trying to communicate? And we're like, well, I don't know. I just thought it'd look cool. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's not communicating much. Yeah. It's a, I like that. Um, that method, I think of figure out where you're trying to head. What, what's the, what's the off ramp you want to get on, you know? 
Yeah, it's the Cheshire Cat, right? Yeah. You know, like Alice Alice comes to a fork in the road. Cheshire Cat shows up and, and she's like, well, which is the right way to go? And he says, well, where are you going? She says, I don't know. And then he says, well, then it doesn't really matter, does it? Choose, <laughs> choose whichever way you want, right? If you don't know where you're going, then no way is wrong. Uh, you know, so, um, yeah. It, but yeah, it's totally like that. I mean, I look at like Scott, like <clears throat> Scott has very specific uh goals of what he's trying to achieve you know he's yeah. doing the coaching and he's doing specific things on youtube and those types of things um and what's interesting is and and i'm i'm interested to hear you kind of speak to this scott is it seems to me like you are very intentionally doing some things and not doing other things like you're skilled enough to where you could do any number of things i mean almost an infinite number of choices and directions that you could go but you're like some of them I, new, some of them old. <laughs> yes, that's true. Uh, because of this, because I want this, I'm only going to do things that move me closer to that. And anything that moves me laterally or away from that, it might be a good thing, but it's not a good thing for what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes to my own detriment, because because <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's there's certain times like I'll like I'll get. Like right now, I'm on this whole wax pack kick, so I'm I'm gonna explore what I can do with this on the side, and who knows, maybe it'll maybe something will come out of it. Sometimes yeah. it won't. Some some things are successful, some things aren't. And but I, you know, my biggest thing is is sticking to one thing. You know, once once mm-hmm. something starts going, because I'll get yeah. distracted, and like oh, I want to try this new thing, and because I've been doing this, you know, just art in general professionally for a while, there are a number of things I could probably do, and and maybe you know, maybe, you know, go work for somebody or something that would probably lead me to have a little more comfortable lifestyle. But then, then I'm like, no, nah, I'm just going to scale back a little bit and, and work on creating this thing and see where it takes me because I don't know. I like to play around with that kind of stuff. So, so, so yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I am I'm kind of dancing around your, your, um, your question, but well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Well, I but just... I mean, if you're, if you're, if your goal was, you know, I want to be the richest person. Right. You know, yeah. In Phoenix, yeah. Yeah. You'd be making a lot of, a lot different decisions than you're yeah. making now. And yeah. that's not to say that you're not going to make money off of these things, right. but I don't think that's your primary objective. No, no. I mean, my, my primary objective is at least in the interim, just make enough to support me so I can make cool stuff and hopefully mm-hmm it'll turn into something, something bigger, you know, but, but I mean, it's just like with the YouTube channel. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't trying to be, I'm still not trying to be like this. You're not trying to be Mr. Beast. No. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to make a living solely off of YouTube. If that happens, that'd be great. But, but I, I would like to, I would like to make it feasible for me to spend the amount of time I am on videos so that I can do that. Cause I really enjoy right. doing that. But at a certain point, you got to keep the lights on and pay the bills and things. So then you sure. got to figure out, oh, okay, well, um, maybe YouTube is for at least right now until maybe something hits or whatever. It's just a way to get my message out on other things that I'm doing, and you know, and mm-hmm. whether it's wax packs or 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 whatever. So, and it kind of goes in phases. I mean, you know, Circworks has had so many different iterations from it orig- originally being kind of like this idea of this character design factory where I would do freelance characters for somebody and, and that would incorporate into a logo or a website or whatever. And then I changed it to sort of a mad science supply company. Now it's kind of got this retro vibe. So it kind of, you know, it, it changes. And, and then, you know, one of these, (laughs) one of these days, something's going to really hit and then hopefully I could be like, Oh yeah, this, this, uh, all the hard work is that I put into this is, is paying off and, I can continue to do and cool stuff like this. Yeah. And if not, yeah. then, then I'll kind of, I, I always, <laughs> I feel like uh, the whole Mr. Toad thing where they, where he talks about how he's got all these manias or just one thing, <laughs> you know, and the, the Disney version where he's, he's like, he just discovered motor cars. So he's, you know, going crazy about motor cars because that's his thing now. So I kind of, I, I get this idea of something really cool and I, you know, I dive head first into that and, and play around in that area for a while and then maybe discover something else. Who knows? 
Scott, you've yeah. won my heart today just by mentioning Mr. Toad, uh, <laughs> who is one of my all-time favorites. I don't. I've I've told you guys about my obsession with Mr. Toad, right? I don't I know. Don't Hold on, have. I'll just show you how obsessed I am. Hang on. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. While uh, while Josh is going getting his shrine to Mr. Toad, um, both both you, uh, Scott and oh, yeah. Josh. Okay. Oh, oh, that's cool. He's got I a adore cat, Toad. Man. Yeah. Is that vinyl? Um, no, it's like a sculpture or whatever. But like my yeah. wife and I were like on the lookout because we love Mr. Toad's Wild Ride and the cartoon. And you're right, the mania is amazing. We need to make a Scott Circland with the mania I, uh, facial expression like T-shirt. Yeah, <laughs> not that that's not super cool, Josh. But I thought you were going to go out in your garage and come in with one of the little cars. Beep beep. Oh yeah, I was <laughs> just going to drive through <laughs> with the or it's or we were. I was just going to take you guys on a ride to hell. <laughs> <laughs> that is the most distorted, twisted children's ride in the world. Uh, what other yeah, ride do you go to hell and back? Literally, yeah, and I, to the point where I, when I was a kid, I had run, I had gone the ride before I saw like one in the Willows, the the Disney version, uh -huh. and, and so I'm waiting for the hell part. I'm like, oh man, I totally got ripped off. That wasn't even in it. <laughs> oh, I wanted to see those little devil dragons coming down. And yeah, <laughs> I love it. Okay, so I want to, I want to, Josh, I want to talk to you and then Scott because I've seen you both do this, but Josh, I think yours is more prominent. Uh, in two stories, mm -hmm. you specifically change styles because yeah. you were changing as, as a narrative technique. Yeah. Right. And so one style, you had a very, a very heavily rendered, uh, you know, kind of like cross hatching kind of comic book style. And then the other style, um, how would you describe that? A, a more um, image. I call it a wonky of... Mary Blair. <laughs> it's yeah, like, right. It was, if you took was... like old cartoon modern stuff and then squished it, mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah, and the characters Mary. had a lot more like yeah of children's character proportions, where you're looking at like the Calvin and Hobbes or the Smurfs or something, where yeah, they're yeah, yeah. kind of three heads tall and you know. Um, but I mean, talk to, talk to me about that because your elements were the same, right? You, yeah, you. And the things that you were experiencing narratively there, the, those didn't change much. Um, compositionally, it changed based on what you're trying to do in that panel. Yeah. But the style changed based on the era of storytelling. So you as an adult struggling yeah. with mental health and faith, and then you as a kid struggling with, you know, interacting with other, other kids and trying to figure out like socialization and things. Those two parallel stories were happening, but each time you would go back and forth, there'd be that stylistic change. Talk, talk about that for a minute, because that's kind of interesting. So I think that's a superpower cartoonists have, and that's actually one of the reasons I'm excited about Dave's book too, because it looks like he's doing a lot of sw style switching, which I'm mm -hmm. a big fan of. Um, because I feel like when we're artists, like why do we relegate ourselves to like one medium or one style, uh, yeah. even for one story, when you can switch if you need to. And, um, and, 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 and I think uh, I think that like for me, it was more of like when I was thinking about the structure of the story, I realized that I wanted two totally different feelings um, to kind of point out the difference in seriousness of like mm. the two kind of experiences of sort of social struggles uh, as well as like mental health struggles. Mm -hmm. um, and I also wanted to add levity to the weight of the heavier um, parts in the more present. Um, and so I wanted a style that was a little more uh, um, kind of friendly. <laughs> um, and then my deep, dark secret of that is for it to be a sneak attack, because, um, you know, in book two, you're not going to get much of that style. So mm. it, another thing that I've crafted it to do is slowly like give you some sugary sweetness to kind of give take the edge off. Um, until the very end where I just hit you with a hammer <laughs> and it's right. like, um, that's, that's kind of the point of the, um, of the structure of it. So it's like thinking about the pacing, the feelings that people will experience when reading it, um, giving them a moment where they can laugh. It's like the little Rosencrantz and Guildenstern bits, you know, of Hamlet or whatever. Um, but at the same time, like with an intention of kind of softening you up for the blow. Because it is a it, right. it is like a, a rough comic, um, yeah. but that also softens you up for hopefully what's like a happy ending. So, but there's intention behind that, and um, 
And again, I think that's a tool that's at our disposal. Um, and I think we should use more. That's one of the yeah. things I like about like Dave Pilkey who does dog man. Um, you know, you look at dog man, you look at captain underpants are two totally different styles. You look at his other children's books that he made before that it's totally different styles. And that man is not restrained by the style he's working in, but mm-hmm. he can probably work in any style. And, and it's fun, uh, to like, I like reading those books to my kid. Cause like he'll even change styles within it. Like he'll have like claymation and stuff like that. Like in his comics, you know, I, th- yeah. I think it's, I think it's genius. And I think people need to do that more, but, um, but also, yeah, don't just do it arbitrarily. Cause that can kind of suck. <laughs> right. But, but when you do that, uh, the concept changes. So like the, yeah. the communication changes and there's, mm-hmm. there's a, a change in the mood and the vibe uh, when we see that stylistic change. And so that's kind of, if you look at, if you look at elements, composition and style as variables uh, in the equation and concept as the result of that equation, when you change one of those variables, it changes the result of the equation. Yeah. Um, Scott, you had, you had um, one that I thought was really interesting. So when you did, um, uh, when you do young and the dead, um, that is a very different style than you did for uh, the anthology when you did the wordless comic, mm-hmm. um, yeah. the guy with the horn rim glasses and stuff. Yeah. Um, talk about why, because obviously you can draw another style, but why did you choose to not do the Young and the Dead style in the in the wordless comic? Yeah, for Young and the Dead, I, I, I guess I was going for a little more kind of young adult look. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's young. If, if anyone's not familiar with those two different styles, young and the dead is very, there's very few spotting of blacks, very few. I mean, it's very, not a whole lot of uh, there, there is shading and, you know, in grayscale and everything, but there's, you know, the line art is, is fairly loose. There's not, it, you know, it's there. Yeah. It's just, it's, 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 it's not an animation style, but it's more simplified, I guess, more, right. I guess, cartoony and everything. Um, and then the one I did for that anthology, which is probably closer to what I'll go with for the next style, even though I want to get a little looser with it or for the next comic I'm, I'm thinking about. There's a lot of heavy blacks and, and everything. Um, and part of that, you know, with Young and the Dead, some of it was just expediency, but some of it was just because because it is more of a kind of, I guess a young adult type comic. Um, that's just the style that I, I I thought would look best for that. So so yeah. Sometimes it's just I I whatever the project is, I, I'll I'll look and kind of figure out what kind of style I want to work work in. And and there'll be like an underline. Like people can even look at like some of my poster designs and things, which is very different. It's very more graphic. It's all done mm-hmm. in Illustrator for the most part. And some people can still pick out like, oh, I can tell that you because of this or the sure. way you draw eyes here or, or or whatever. So so I think some of that's probably going to show through no matter what. It's like I'll listen to like like a couple of friends of mine who are voice actors and they'll do these what most people would say, like just dead on impersonations. But I've I know their voice. I've heard listened to them talk enough times and and I know them that I can pick out. I can I can tell who that it's yeah. them doing the voice just mm-hmm. because there's a little bit of them in it that I can tell, but most people won't be able to pick up on. So I think, I think your whatever your natural way of you doing things for so long will kind of creep in, but yep. the, you have that conscious decision of, Oh, I'm going to kind of shift and I'm going to do more, you know, more of a, you know, you know, like whether it's you got heavy blacks or, or just more line mm-hmm. art type type deal to it. So, yeah. You know, Scott, like that's really interesting too, because I do see like a through line in your work, but it is interesting because your commercial work uh, um, and then also your own work like does switch styles all the time. But there is this like through line of identity of like, I can recognize that it's Scott. Even when you were showing, you know, the the, um, one last week, the variant cover for Figu uh, Furthermore or whatever, it's like somehow it's not your... style but somehow it is and 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 that's i i think that's one of the things that um you know like younger artists should be reassured with is like i i mean i've made t-shirt designs illustrations all sorts of stuff in all kinds of styles the graphic novel i'm working on right now is in a completely different style and yet people still will be like oh that's like that's your stuff like that's 
that's mm-hmm. Josh's style. And I'm like, but it's like <clears throat> this one's rendered and different and the characters look and it's like, no, there's like a through line um, regardless, you know, uh, and your identity will come out. So it's like it's like, you know, punk rockers like, you know, you think about like um, I'm wearing a Clash T-shirt. The Clash, one of the things that made them the Clash was that they were like, ah, we're going to use like weird reggae, which at the time was like, you know, a very like underground thing that they were just getting influenced by and bringing into like this other thing mixed with influences of like shreddy guitarists mixed with like definitely like raw punk and like all kinds of stuff. And and you get this interesting cocktail. But when you hear a Clash song, nobody's like, who did this song? <laughs> you know, you're like. It's not like you're like, oh, this is a reggae band now. It's like, no, they're like they they're using like a weird timing on the drums, but you always recognize the clash, you know. Yeah. Um, whereas if they were just playing the same song over and over again, unless you're ACDC, you really shouldn't be doing that, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, Scott or uh, Josh, put your put your little toad figure front and center in the camera while I while I ask you this question. Oh, okay, let's do this. Hold on. Oh wait, wait! Oh, wrong, wrong camera. Here we go. There we go. Okay. Oh, that's a different so, one. <laughs> quite, yeah, he he was showing that earlier. Wait, wait, oh, wait! Were we talking about the mania? Yeah. Oh no, I'm feeling mania. Oh, oh no! <laughs> <laughs> okay, My wife and for, I are obsessed with Toad. Question for Josh: How did Mister Toad die? I know there's a Mister Toad tombstone uh, or tomb statue at Disney. I don't remember him dying though. I don't think he he, he he didn't die in the in the in the cartoon. Yeah. In the and cartoon just in the ride, die. I think the ride he probably went off the. I think he ran into a train or yeah, ran, he went off a cliff or something. Okay, this is how you, morbid as Mister Toad. <laughs> this is how morbid that ride is, Mister. To- it's a version kind of like the movie, except that Mister Toad goes on a bender, goes to a bar, yeah, oh, yeah. gets loaded. <laughs> And just drives and gets run over by a train. And then you go to hell. <laughs> so, yeah, there there is a children's ride that still to this day, you you get on, you go to a bar, you get loaded, you get on a, in a car, get hit by a train and go to hell. <laughs> I, <have no laughs> I love that ride. I have no memory of this at all. I, yeah, I, I, I am... I'm being mocked lately for being so utilitarian, but I don't enjoy Disneyland because I just don't like paying to wait in lines. Yeah, I don't like the crowds either. <laughs> so, yeah. There's a lot of people there, and I don't know. But yeah, so I don't remember. I remember that there is a Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. I don't remember anything about it. Because I yeah. think I've been to Disneyland like twice, maybe three Oh times. my gosh. Okay, so we need yeah. to do like an art casters <laughs> trip yeah. to Disneyland and go on Mr. Toad's. We need to take Corey uh, to hell I'm after, totally down after for binge. That. <laughs> you you will see me um, trying my darndest to have a good time. Yeah. As I, well, the thing that's you have great to understand about, yeah. you have to understand my dad und- he knew how much each M M&M and M costs. So like if you like he would calculate <laughs> yeah. that. Like we went to a water park one time. You've told me this. I love this. Yeah, story. we went to a water park one time and there was a lightning storm. <laughs> and so they cleared out the park. And then the lightning we just my dad was like, let's just wait it out. And so we waited it out. And then <clears throat> each time we ran up the tower to go down the slides, we were running because there was no one else at the park. There was like ten other people that stayed. And he would be yelling to everyone. Now it's only six dollars a ride, and then we'd go down, <laughs> and then you'd go back up. Now we're only paying five eighty seven a head for each slide that we go down. And so every time we went down, he would recalculate how much. And so when I sit there, I'm like waiting in this line yeah. is costing me twenty seven dollars. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm kind of like every not that 15 bad, minutes. But, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I understand that. Like I haven't been to Disneyland for that reason in a long time. But I will say, anytime I do go, I just set aside that worry at yeah. the door because at the end of the day, I really do yeah. like the environment. And I think, um, and you know, I can understand people who are critical of Disney because you know, I mean, all you have to do is look up like if I works and Disney and not be a one hundred percent on board fan. But mm-hmm. but still. Like to me, the Imagineers and the way they build the rides and just the design aesthetic that they pay attention to, like everything in that area, it's I still think there's nothing quite like it. Um, you know, 
where where you can just really see like art just in everything and really considered stuff like little details you know Mm -hmm. um that's my favorite part of disneyland is like the the extra stuff you know yeah Um, not not so much the rides but like even the lines to the rides i think I love all the little details. What about yeah, it? Gary said that I've never done it at Disneyland. <clears throat> I think it's quite a bit more at Disneyland. But when uh, for my birthday, Jen took me to Universal and got like the VIP thing. That's the way to do it. Yeah, no waiting in lines, no anything. Yeah. I was it was awesome. Although it was it was talk about compared to, to Corey's story, it was like it was it was it was just pouring that day. So all <laughs> our pictures are like, and we're like freezing and. And, uh-huh. you know, it's just, it's, but still we had a great time even with that. So, yeah, I love, I love that. Um, I just love the idea though, that if it did rain, you're like drinking a soda and you're like, okay, right now we're paying like a dollar a minute or whatever, you know, like, but I understand that. Cause like, again, um, you know, I mean, we're all artists, so none of us are, um, are Elon Musk or something. So it's like, sure you do. It is hard to set aside the, um, that or just being like, I could have gone camping, you know, 40 times and I went to Disneyland once. I'll for tell the same you, cost, I'll, you know, yeah, like, I'll tell you, I'll tell you where this comes in handy. Yeah. I, I was, I was getting my, I was in my master's program and I was looking around, I was looking around the room and I saw, because I was older when I got my master's, right? I was, I was in my thirties, thir- mid thirties. Yeah. And, um, I saw a lot of these young kids and uh, they were not taking it seriously. And I knew that they were paying at least as much as what I was paying. I was yeah. on a scholarship, but it was only a 50% scholarship. With my 50% scholarship, because that semester, it was like a survey of illustration. And so, like, one week you'd do oils, and the next week you'd do gouache, and the next yeah. week you'd do pastel. And so, like, every week you were spending hundreds of dollars on supplies. Oh, yeah. Um. Anyway, I figured out that that semester... Uh, if you count tuition and supplies, it cost me three hundred and eleven dollars a day to go to school, uh, seven days a week. And so, every moment of my life during my master's was dedicated to squeezing every drop of value out of that situation. Yeah, and I looked around at all these people, and they're like phoning stuff in and not listening to the professor, yes. and they're not taking the critique seriously. And I'm like. See, I am cheap enough that I am going to get every drop of value oh, in yeah. this situation. And like people taking a class a second time because they failed it or whatever. Oh, I'm like, bizarre. holy crap! That's that's thousands. That's a of rich dollars. man's game. <laughs> that is, yeah, it's it's a rich man's <laughs> game or somebody who's going to be in debtor's prison yeah, for the rest yeah. of their life. But like, or somebody this... I'd like to sell a bridge to. Right there was somebody who. I'm trying to not identify this person because of what I'm telling the story, but there was somebody who was in this program with me and they have a candidacy review and the candidacy review is a bit of a mercy. Like halfway through, you've got to basically pitch. Here's, here's the stuff I've made so far in classes, you know, and uh, if you pass, then you get to continue with the program. Yep. If you don't pass, then you get to this remedial track where they try to catch you up. And then you go through a candidacy review again. And if you fail a second time, they kick you out. Yep. And you don't get to graduate. And um, this yeah, individual... Yeah, like that's something a lot of people don't realize about like a master's program is there's a couple levels of review before you're even allowed to uh, halfway kill yourself to write a thesis. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so anyway, <clears throat> this, this person that I had been in multiple classes with could not draw. It's an illustration program. I was in illustration design. So my program was an amalgamation of graphic design and illustration. But they were in an illustration program, could not draw. And they weren't doing what I would consider enough to learn how to draw. And um, anyway, didn't pass the candidacy review, went to the remedial, uh, didn't pass the second candidacy review, they're out of the program. I I was messaging them and I said, hey, so what are you going to do? I'll just appeal it. And I'm thinking... If they let you back in, it's going to cost you another ten to thirty thousand dollars. And if you maintain this pace of not getting any better, yeah. you're not going to get a job. Like yeah. you're not you're not putting yourself in a position where you can earn that back. Like it's a bit of a mercy that you're out of the program. They let them back in the program, and I have watched them over the last eight 
ish years uh, be in the same job they were in before they got their masters, and nothing has changed. And anyway, just look at that. I'm like, why wouldn't you do everything you po- like? I remember, yeah. and this kind of goes to our topic. I remember I had a buddy because at the time I was living in an apartment, and my landlord would not let me put a dish on the roof, so I had no internet. And so I, in the middle of the night, I would have to drive to my friend's house and park in his driveway to steal his Wi-Fi and like turn assignments in and stuff. Um, and sometimes they would be home. And so I'd go sit on their couch and do it. Right. And uh, I remember one time he was like, didn't you like, what is, the, what are the requirements for this? And I told him, he's like, it's, it's like Sunday night. Weren't you done with the requirements on like Tuesday? Like, why are you still working on this? And I'm like, it's costing me $311 a day. Like I am going to absolutely f- learn You're like, every aspect. We are going of this. on this water slide, <laughs> lightning or not, <laughs> right. young man. Yep. <laughs> and so, but I mean, I would go to the I would go to the professors, and I'm sure I was super annoying, and I would be like, like break this down for me, mm. you know, like, like tell me exactly what you're talking. About. I'm not I'm not looking for you to change my grade. I am looking for you to pinpoint all of the things that I am doing wrong or the things that you think that I could improve yeah. step by step. And then I will figure out ways to make them better. Yeah. Um, and it was super useful. I mean, it yeah. was, I, I went light years faster in my master's than I would have uh, otherwise. Yeah. I, I, I always felt that was a benefit I had in school too, was like um, I had gotten a lot of my experimenting and stuff like that out of the way before I even went for my bachelor's. So by the time I transferred from like a JC, you know, um, and again, being like a poor guy from like who had to do JCs, you know, like I wasn't going to pay, you know, for those first two general ed years, like, but when I could get it for a hundred bucks a semester or whatever. Um, but yeah, like, so I really appreciated when I got transferred. So I went from being like a, like high B a student to like just straight 4.0 kind of level of, uh, dedication once I transferred because I was in my major and I was like, I need to learn everything there is about this, but it was weird to be surrounded by people who were again, unaware and just like there to party. And I'm like, okay, parties are fun, but like, I really want to like, uh, get this art thing down because I'm not going to be able to do this a bunch, you know, like, um, and I think that that is actually, um, uh, that actually, that could even come down to like the deconstruction thing too, where it's like deconstructing how much, like what the cost of something is, what's the cost of time, right? What's, what's right. the cost of labor here? What's the paper that Scott needs to order? How much does that cost versus what the client's going to pay for that pack? Right. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, but that's, that is, I, I love that about you, Corey. I think that's, um, that's probably a value, honestly. It can be a downside though. We've both huge, talked about it. it we both experience downside, sure. mass amounts of guilt if we spend money. Yeah. <laughs> um, Paul, Paul, Paul is, is calling me on the carpet here. And to be fair, you never know where they are in their life and what they're going through. Yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah. True. And I'm not, I'm not judging them. It sounds like I'm judging them. I'm not judging them, but I'm looking at it from a financial utilitarian standpoint. And I'm just saying, if you're not able to put something, if you're not able to get something out of this thing that you're paying for, maybe paying for it right now, isn't the best idea. And, and so if there is something going on in your life, you know, that, that is making it so you can't, uh, you can't do this thing. um, It's not going to be a benefit to you. So in, in certain, in certain things like, certification for certain things and and whatever like it is a ticket to entry but like in a skill-based industry um the degree that you get is not super useful if you don't have the skills and so in my admittedly very narrow reductive utilitarian view of how money works um i don't like uh paying for things and not getting the value out of them and I, i tell this to my students all the time i'm like uh, I find this fascinating that I let's say that let's say that you sign up for a program where you get to watch two movies a week and you sign up for a 14 week program. So you're going to watch 28 movies in a three month period. Right. And um, what if they just sent you an email and said, hey, uh, by the way, something's going on right now. So you're canceling the movie is your is your reaction going to be like, yay, like I, they canceled the movie. I don't have to go see the movie. 
It's like, you know, you you paid for that. You're going to want a refund. You're going to want yep. a whatever. I said, but if I cancel class, you guys are excited. If there's a holiday and a class day and you go don't get that class time back, you guys are excited. But like, you're paying for me to be here. You're. I would hope that you're paying for the experience of what's kind of going on in this classroom and the and the value exchange that's that's happening. I understand the mentality of not wanting to go to class. I get it, but I'm so cheap that I just can't. I can't fathom why you would want to miss class. Um, I get missing sometimes, but but it's just like I, you you paid you paid somebody to teach you something. <laughs> So, I, it, 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 that is one of the like one of the benefits uh, and and downsides of, of teaching college is the fact that you know you're paying to be here <laughs> like you know right you're paying to be here so yeah um that that is actually interesting but um yeah we're not judging we're just judging yeah we are not but we are for example if you have if anybody's listening and you ever want to be motivated to go go to class uh, take tuition divide it by the number of class periods that you have for that semester. And then you understand that you are paying a couple hundred dollars for an hour's worth of uh, information. And that can be really motivating when you don't have a couple hundred dollars just lying around and you're like, well, would I just light $200 on fire? You know, like, would I do that? Probably not. So I yeah. don't know when you're young. I mean, it, you got to burn money sometimes. No, I'm just kidding. Right. Um, but I, but I, 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 so there's a utility to it, but a downside to it too. Um, I, you know, I, out of curiosity, Corey, um, speaking of like you, the, the utility of it. And I think most people could understand the downside of being too frugal, right? Like if you're, if you're too frugal, you could actually get to the point where you're not even enjoying your food because you're just thinking about the cost, you know? Sure. Um, so it can it can come at the cost of, like, the whole purpose uh, we make money anyway. Like, why are we making money? We're making money to, you know, have experiences with our families and stuff like that. And, right. Um, to live. Yeah, to live and stuff like that. And if mm-hmm. it starts interfering with that, then why were we making money in the first place? Yeah. Um, but uh, tying that back into the, um, the kind of the topic of deconstruction, is there a limit to the amount you would deconstruct? Is there a point where it might be valuable to at some times actually just go, you know, this would be cool. (laughs) Okay. Yes. I think, I think this is interesting. So I was listening to a podcast and I'm blanking on it, but there is a, there is a professor out there who has taken one issue of an Iron Man comic book and he has been studying this one issue for like over 20 years. And he does all of these different projects based on this one issue. And so like he did, uh, he did a series of paintings where it was just like the main color of each panel. And he would just do this big, like 20 by 30 oil painting of every page of just squares. Right. Um, he has done so many different deconstructions of this issue. And I don't want to call that guy out because he's enjoying it and he's getting a lot of value from it. In my opinion, for me, I would think that I would be wasting my time if I didn't stop and make stuff from what I'm learning. Yeah. Outside of that. And so I think it's a cyclical thing. And so when you're going out and you're trying to use this to learn something, uh, I say you go out. You find something that you like, you deconstruct it, and you figure out what makes it work. And then yes. you apply that to something that you're doing, a project of your own, and you try to figure that out. And uh, and then you, you you after the fact, you do a post-mortem, and you look at like what could have gone better. Mm-hmm. And uh, you try to go find things that are doing the thing that you lack. You know, what lack I yet? And you go figure out what you lack and, and go find somebody that's good at that thing and deconstruct their work and apply that to the next thing that you do. And so I think there's two things that you could do where deconstruction becomes an inhibitor rather than a force multiplier. Um, one is you only mm-hmm. deconstruct. And and so it's just, it's just a, a learning paralysis situation where you, you never take action. Yeah. The other one is um, where you, you hyper fixate on a particular thing and it, it doesn't necessarily get um, worked back into your work. And so, mm. you know, I know people that, they just do figure drawing all the time and that's great, but it's like, 
but they don't they don't apply that to anything. Now, as a as a fulfillment thing, if that if you're just getting fulfillment for that and you're not trying to achieve some sort of artistic purpose or skill mastery or something, and you just enjoy doing thing, I don't I don't think that's a problem. You know, yeah. like if if you just want to if you like crocheting and you don't care if you sell anything. I, I say, hey, have at it and enjoy making stuff, you know, and then pull it apart at the end. I don't care. But if your goal is mastery and 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 progress, then there needs to be an application and then a review. It's a cyclical. It's a cyclical thing of deconstruction, application, review, identification, deconstruction, until mm. you continually this it, you spiral up through that cycle rather than getting stuck in a in a loop. Yeah, like. I'm thinking about like somebody who wants to get good at life drawing. Right. Um, I had a kid like show me a drawing a couple days ago and they had had no art classes and they, I, I don't think we're aware of my, the amount I've studied art <laughs> and they were like, what do you think of my drawing? And I was like, well, what kind of feedback do you want? Do you want a critique or do you want, do you want just like an opinion? And I asked them like how many art classes have you had and stuff like that. The reason I was asking that is, um, you know, and, and Corey will know this, you know, there's this process of deconstructing your own identity in, in the way that your mind thinks with symbols that has to happen with young artists um, and designers uh, where, you know, your, your instincts to like draw with symbols, uh, you're trained to draw with symbols, which I think is a, a shame about our education system that they mm -hmm. go, oh, no, no, no no, Timmy, this is how you draw a tree. And it's like a symbol. And it's like, no, Timmy right. was right. Scribble that tree. Um, but anyhow, um, breaking that symbol system is so important to start observing, right? So a, a lot of it starts with observation, with drawing. and But observing and <coughs> deconstructing, like Corey was saying. But there is that weird point where you could just be observing and deconstructing and at no point ever bring pen to paper, right? Like at some yeah. point you have to kind of get your hands dirty, screw up a bunch <laughs> and then, and then kind of <laughs> learn from it. Um, so there's a fine balance where you could, you know, you don't want to like beautiful mind yourself um, to where you're, you know, deconstructing existence, you know, <laughs> right? Um, or just pointlessly deconstructing, you know, that, that goes to our, Corey and I's favorite analogy about the J.R.R. Tolkien writer guy, you know. The, right, yeah, the backpack written. full of uh, mm -hmm. story Bibles, but they don't have a chapter one written. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we've got a good question to end on since we're at, a, we're at 90 minutes here. <clears throat> uh, the friend you have with the sketchbook are very, of various arms, legs, and heads. Not, not a friend of mine. I don't want to claim that I actually know. I've had conversations with him. It's Ryan Otley. Um, but I don't think he even knows who I am. Um, if they chose to make a new comic, but shade in those body parts to make the character a person of color, in your mind does that change a little? I would say that that would be an elements change, probably not a compositional change. The so composition is the arrangement of the elements, the placement of those things. Um, I do think that does change the messaging. Um, but I think the, the reason it received backlash is because there's a small minority of people that just tend to freak out about everything. Um, <laughs> and some of them yeah. are probably racist or might even just be like, I don't like change. I like, I rem it reminds me of Garth in, uh, in Wayne's world where he's like, we fear change. And he starts smashing the ham, the hand with the hammer, you know? Um, some people are just locked into, uh, you know, like this is the way it was in my childhood. And if mm -hmm. you change that, then it's wrong. Um, but I think uh, mythical sea creatures can be any nationality because yeah. who cares? They're not real and they're mythical. And, but I do think it does. I do think it changes the concept. It changes the message that you're portraying. Um, but I don't, I don't fear change and I don't think change is necessarily good or bad. It, it does change it. But I yeah. think people of color should have mermaids that they can see on the screen as well. Why not? Now, um, if you're considering that as an artist too, um, uh, it is, it is a different palette to paint with too. So like sure. if you're mm -hmm. painting somebody or, or drawing somebody with a different skin tone, than the paints were racistly designed to not like, right. there's a lot of tools that weren't designed to, uh, to be inclusive. And so 
you have to kind of relearn some color structures and uh, that's where it helps to just learn complementary colors and stuff like that. So you can well, come up yeah. with backgrounds, especially if you want like appealing um, characters and stuff like that. Like there's different color that works to refract um, off of different skin tones and stuff. But what you'll start realizing, and this is the beauty of observing and deconstructing. Once you start drawing from life or painting from life, you start realizing like no one person is one shade of cut. Like there is right. so much color in every human being, like in the shadow under their eye, as opposed to like the weird discoloration that happens on everybody's nose right. to like just bizarre skin tones that are all over the place. Um, that, and, and just, yeah. and just the way that light works. Like yeah. the reason that we see stuff is because uh, the light that is reflected is the stuff that wasn't absorbed. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you have like a like a black African um, that doesn't have any 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 other um, ethnicity mixed in, and you're gonna see a lot of really interesting colors in the highlights that you wouldn't see with like a European Caucasian, uh, because uh, so much is absorbed that you're gonna get a lot more bright purples and things like that. Yeah, Chris is saying Word. there's no such no such thing as flesh tone, right? There's Agreed. not like a color that you're like because you're also an environmental situation yeah. right it's not like you can say like josh's skin is this pantone number yeah it's because wherever josh goes it's going to be an environmental change based on the light and the color of the light mm -hmm. and what is reflecting off of different things um but yeah i say uh i say get it get out there and get as many different uh, as many different skin tones and nationalities and things out there as you possibly can yeah because it's it's fascinating that's kind of to to bring this full circle what makes humans human is is really interesting both in what is and isn't and you can have drastic variations in ratio and color um and size um, you know, the narrowness or broadness of someone's nose or the thinness of someone's eyes or the pigment of their skin, their height. You know, I mean, I, I can stand next to my siblings who look very much like mm -hmm. me and I am, I am a full like six to eight inches shorter than they are. There's different variations. Corey's yet, not lying. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> you guys, you guys do not like, there is a point where it's like, you guys are related. Anyway. Yeah. I'm a little, I'm a little dude compared to some of them, but, um, but, but given that nobody looks at any of us and says that person isn't human they yep. must be something other than human and so there's that iconic humanness uh and that's that's what i love about this is is no one no one is looking at it well not no one uh there are horrible people out there that are into into eugenics and things that are that are thinking this type of stuff but any normal rational thinking person is not going to look at somebody who has a variation uh, uh of the norm in 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 height or weight or shape or 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 color or nationality or ethnicity or whatever and say that that person is other than that yeah. they're just saying that is a variation in those things and that's that part of deconstruction that i find really interesting is to be authentic in what we're creating um i wouldn't shy away from that you have to be careful when you abstract it but do you, you lean into it like i i want representation of, mm -hmm. of differences because that's what the world is like um and so anyway i just and well and and it's so change... it's so funny that people call it like this like this new liberal agenda and it's like have you ever seen like uh, like othello like yeah. <laughs> like there's like there's been diversity there hasn't been enough but the point being like you know writers <laughs> have always been interested in should always be interested in diversity because it allows for more stories and who doesn't want more stories right. or more variety um and the other thing is like really when you start looking down at the gene level we're all what like five percent genghis Khan anyway so <laughs> right um, my uh my main gripe with the little mermaid remake which i didn't see is my gripe with all of the remakes i just I don't like the seen. rebooting to live action right I don't, I don't mind it. I don't yeah. care because I don't have it's to see anything. Boring. My, yeah. my problem with it is it is literally just a giant megalithic corporation yeah. trying to maintain Cash uh, copy, copyright protection on mm -hmm. something that was public domain before they got their grubby hands on it and destroyed <laughs> copyright laws in yeah. the U.S. That's my main problem with it. I don't care what it is. But it didn't colors. work with Steamboat Willie, did it, Disney? It, it did. It did <laughs> for him. about. It did for about a century. <laughs> I know, but we've got him now. We own him <laughs> collectively. Yes. Yeah. So, Wait anyway. till they come for your mermaid. <laughs> yeah. <I'm> sorry. <laughs>
Yeah. So I don't know. I got to go look at the the original original story. Is the red hair a Disney invention or is that is that public domain? Well, that's the um, other hilarious thing is like it's not like that was the first Little Mermaid, <laughs> you know. No, I mean yeah. Hans in the story. Yeah, from from, from most of the interpretations I read previous or illustrations I've seen, she kind of had blonde hair, but. But that's mm. that. I mean, so that's the thing that's curious. So if you make a Little Mermaid with red hair, I mean, there's only so many hair colors. So if you make right. one with red hair, does that mean you're infringing on Disney's copyright? Even if it maybe the style is totally different. I, I think according to you, Disney, if it's like ten percent close, yeah. they're gonna they're if gonna consider a, suing. If you put a red shirt on a yellow bear, you're in trouble. Mm. But so so what happens? Without a red shirt, you're fine. What happens if Warner Brothers makes it? makes a little mermaid and makes theirs have yeah. black hair and then and paramount has a little mermaid and theirs has blonde hair then then what do you do unless you uh, if, you, green if hair. you've got <laughs> if you've got people if you've got people turning into sea foam and stone yeah. at the end you're probably okay yeah 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 but <laughs> if you haven't getting married on a big ship that impales a giant octopus creature right yeah, yeah no. probably not okay obviously <laughs> One one quick thing too, uh, it you know, do you think the fans would flip out if we reboot Little Mermaid with Frank Salazar as the main character? I think we should. I think we should do the Frank Salazar Little Little uh, Mermaid because he, um, he he does the best part of your world on on the planet that I've ever heard. The best rendition. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, I think I think Chris is probably right here. Hans Christian Andersen probably gave her Danish features. Yeah. Um, I. But but my understanding, I could be wrong. I think um, Anderson was a gatherer of oral oral tradition, right? So it existed prior to him. He's he was just mm. the one that wrote it down. Um. So yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> Gary said right. enough with the woke Frank Salazar content. <laughs> <laughs> I just want I just want all Frank Salazar's to feel like they're included in yeah. all all works. That's right. Um, that's my new artistic goal is to include Frank in as many different roles as I possibly can. I love all it. right. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, deconstruct the thoughts on Little Mermaid as much as you'd like uh, after the fact. I'd love to hear your opinion on why I'm wrong and um, and leave that in the comments. Let's see if we can start oh no! Please let's, don't, don't leave that let's, one. Let's start it. Let's start a fight <laughs> on Josh's channel. So if you if you think that uh, if you think that um, Josh is wrong, then mm, get yeah. really mad and yell in all caps uh, in the comments of this video. I forgot it was on my channel. Yeah, bring it. <laughs> Come on, let's go. Let's go. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So. Uh, I feel like you were hosting and now I'm hosting. I'm just going to say you can find my stuff at coreycurr.com slash email if you want to be notified of these videos. And go check out the last two. They're short and they are um, densely packed and I am spending way more time than I should making them. So including little custom animations and new illustrations that have not existed before these videos. So it's it's a, it's a labor of love. Go check those out and leave a comment on... Uh, whether you do agree, disagree, or something um, on on either of those most two most recent, doing the drive by disagreements, I disagree. I hate this. You suck. That's fine too. It's, <laughs> it, it all helps the algorithm. That's that's great. Uh, Josh, where can we find your stuff? Uh, you can find me lurking around on this channel. Uh, you can uh, pick up Jacob's apartment or two stories. Um, and uh, it, and I just want to highlight how cool it is. I, like anytime we have episodes like this where like a guest drops out or like, you know, for, for whatever reason, we just have to kind of do just the three of us. It always reminds me of like why we've been doing this show forever, because it's like we could talk for like five hours, like just collectively, I think, as, as friends. So it's um, it's super fun to um, ha it, it was really interesting. And I learned some stuff from this conversation. So uh, thanks, Corey, for bringing that to the table, too. Um and uh yeah uh scott where can everybody find you and um and also how can they sign up for this mailing list before axel rose comes and invades the end of this yeah so you can find me at my website at circleworks.com where you can find digital products my comic book young and the dead and uh prints and all kinds of cool stuff or on my website uh no that was my website <laughs> or, or on my youtube channel uh where you can uh find tons and tons of you know i my content goes back pretty far as far as 
comic making content and things my series making comics 101 and then the new stuff that i'm doing which is uh which is kind of taking a look at old school old-fashioned uh 70s 70s through 90s classic nostalgia and kind of recreating it and everything so definitely check that out um and then this show we do we do this show pretty much every single week and sometimes we'll have uh we'll have a different guest on not today we kind of you know had somebody have to bow out but uh we usually have a different guest we have and it also rotates around our three channels and typically on a thursday but that could maybe maybe we have to do it on wednesday one day but the the point is uh, whatever we're doing, uh, it gets confusing. So if you want to know exactly where we're going to be and everything, join our mailing list, and there should be a link in the description of this video. Um, and then you will be alerted when we have a when we have a show coming up. So yeah, check that out. Oh, and the Mister Toad. Okay. Um, oh man, you know, I, you guys. So I was going to say this one thing, but I'm a little worried that I'm going to get cut off like midway by axel rose for some reason i'm not sure why i'm kind of concerned about that but this one goes out to the art casters i say you're catching your spell art casters catching your spell you're gonna cast that spell strike the hell wow We'll see you next time. Bye.